about what the candidate wants, what the job seeker wants. And so when you start thinking about why someone would want your job, you start writing job ads that outperform everyone else's. And so when a candidate sees all the ads for all the employers, you want yours to be able to stand out. So in this webinar, we're going to talk about the key elements that make a difference in, in how you write your job ads. And don't worry, it's not about clever ad copy, and you don't have to think like it's Mad Men. It's not, this isn't Madison Avenue. These are just some better questions to ask yourself uh, when you write your ads. All right? So when you start to recruit, your, your job ad sets the tone for your entire relationship you're going to have with your new employee. It's your first impression. For most of you, unless you're with a really well-branded organization that, that's kind of a household name, for most of us when we're recruiting, that, that job ad may be the first time the candidates ever heard about our organizations. And when a job ad just talks about responsibilities of the job and the qualifications, their first impression of you is what you care about and not what they care about. So if you want to hire substantial people, write a substantial ad. If you want to hire mission-oriented people, talk about your mission. And if you want to hire achievement-oriented people, which most of us do, you want to write an ad that appeals to their need for achievement. Top performers want to know what your performance expectations are. But if you think about it, very few job ads actually answer that question. So we're going to get into that a little bit uh, further along in the, in the conversation today. But before you even start recruiting, you need to understand how to appeal to the kind of people that you can actually retain. You need to, to understand what engages people at work and why they quit and, and how you can craft a job ad that helps you set the tone for long-term employee retention. So let's look at why someone would leave another organization and come to you and, and think about how you can write a job ad that would have them uh, come to your organization for the right reasons and stick around. So let's take a look at a couple of surveys of uh, employee retention. So there's three big surveys that we're going we're gonna to talk through. The, the first is my favorite. Uh, it's my favorite book that nobody has ever read. I give a lot of presentations to HR groups, and so far I have yet to meet somebody else who's read this book, but it's, it's really quite a wonderful book. It's called The Enthusiastic Employee. The author is David Sirota. He's got a, a consulting firm. And his firm surveyed 2.5 million people over 25 years and across the generations, not just the millennials, not just the baby boomers, not just the Gen Xers, but across the generations, he found several key things that the majority of people want. So uh, the first one is equity. People want to be treated fairly. Uh, they don't want to have, you know, favoritism shown and that sort of thing. They want camaraderie. They want to have warm, interesting, cooperative relations with other people in the, in the workplace. They want to like who they're working with. Uh, and they want achievement. They want to take pride in their accomplishments. They want to do things, do them well, and they want to be recognized for that. So it's kind of three very straightforward things. And what's interesting is when people come into to jobs, they're really quite enthusiastic. The first six months of employment is kind of the honeymoon period, and they're, they're, they, the new employee has high hopes that things are going to work out well. And sometime around six months, people start to become demotivated. And these three factors tend to be the reasons that people tend to lose their enthusiasm for a new job. They're either thwarted in their ability to get things done, they're working with a coworker who's just difficult to work with, or they just don't perceive that they're being treated fairly um, uh, in the workplace. So when you, when you look at what people want regardless of their age, regardless of where they are in their career, people want to work together toward a common goal, and they want to achieve something. Uh, and anytime you see someone who isn't in that category, it may be that the workplace just didn't um, – promote their own desire to achieve those things, and, and that employee might be up for grabs, and that might be who you're recruiting, and your recruiting message needs to be appealing to them. So let's go on to the next 
big survey. This survey is a, a, a DC consulting firm called Human R. They surveyed 250,000 people over many, many years, and they asked dozens of questions. And the how people answered these four questions really predicted the retention. So how people answered these four questions actually predicted whether they'd stay or leave the organization. And let's go through the four questions here. The, the people want to know that they're going to play an important role in the organization a year from today. They want to have a manager who recognizes their accomplishments and who they can have a, a candid conversation about performance. They want to be marketable. They want to be worth more in the outside world in the future than they are today. And they want to have confidence in the leadership's ability to handle the changes that challenge the business. They don't want to have, it's, it's not that they're asking that the business not have any problems. It's not that they're asking that the job be easy. They're just saying they want a manager or a leadership team that understands the challenges. They want to be in an important role in the organization, and they want to get something done. So this research confirms that you know employees who have good managers and feel connected to the business are more likely to stay. And if the opportunity to build skills is lacking, or the confidence is eroding, you can expect more turnover. So let's get on to the third retention study. And this is the one everyone's heard about. It's the Gallup organization, Marcus Buckingham. He's a writer and a consultant, and he's practically a religion at this point. So, so the Gallup Q12, lots of organizations have hired Gallup to do employee um, surveys about it, uh, employee uh, engagement. And, um, and there's a lot of talk about, um, well, if our, if our engagement numbers are up or our engagement numbers are down, we should take action about it. Um, so let's go through. Uh, when Gallup looked at, at enthusiasm and engagement of employees, they came up with 12 key questions. And, and for today, we're just going to talk about seven significant ones that affect employment advertising. And the first one is, do I know what's expected of me at work? Do I have the materials and equipment I need to do the work right? Do I have the opportunity to do what I do best every day? Is there someone who encourages my development? Does the mission of the company make me feel like my work is important? In the last six months, have I talked with somebody about my progress and have I had opportunities to learn and grow? So if you look at all of these three surveys, across all three of the surveys, we're talking about achievement, we're talking about accomplishment, we're talking about performance, we're talking about the ability to make a difference so your job is important. Um, so whether you believe that high employee engagement leads to success or that people in successful companies just feel better about working there, you know, you may not have built Google, but if you walk in and, and the company's winning and feels successful, then you feel successful. So whether engagement leads to success or success leads to engagement kind of isn't the point. Either way, when you look at all of these retention surveys, the ability to achieve something and grow professionally is the key thing people are looking for. So when you write job advertising, when you, when you put an ad out there to attract new people, you need to think about what the top performers want, and you need to think about what they're going to want to see in your ad. So the key takeaways are going to be, you know, they want another job is important. They want clear performance expectations, and they want an environment where they can achieve. And if your job advertising addresses those points, you're going to get more of the top performers responding to you than you would uh, with a traditional job ad. Um, the, the thing to think about when someone's looking at your job ad is they're, they're not wanting you to say that the job's going to be easy. They're just worried that you're setting them up to fail. They're wary that you might put them on the wrong team with the wrong tools or have unrealistic performance expectations. Just like you're assessing the risk of hiring them, they're assessing the risk of working for you. So the more you've thought about the job, the less risky you appear to be to the candidates. And you're going to attract more and better candidates when you think about the first impression that your ad makes. 
your hiring process and your job advertising in particular gives people clues about how you operate. It signals your culture. Uh, if, if your first impression is the job ad and it's not well thought out, they assume you haven't thought about the job. They assume you haven't thought about people. That may not be fair. It may not be accurate. But people's first impression, all they have to go on is what they see. So if the ad isn't particularly well done, they assume you haven't really thought about the job. And top performers, the people who really achieve results, they have choices. They can afford to be selective. If they see 50 ads, they're not going to apply to all 50. They're going to pick the top two or three that, that seem like what they want, and that's where they're going to go. So let's talk a little bit more about this question of what is a top performer. Everybody's got a different definition of a top performer, and the top performer at one company is not necessarily the, the top performer at another company. In my work as an executive search consultant, I hear people say, they tell me all the time, they want to hire an A player or a high achiever or a top performer. They want to hire somebody in the top 10% of their peer group. But what does that mean really? Because it's going to vary. There is no single definition for a top performer. It's going to vary by job. And it's always going to be relative. If someone's terrific and a top performer in Des Moines, Iowa, how does that compare to someone who's in that same kind of a job in Manhattan? The top performer in Des Moines, the standard might be different than in Manhattan. The top performer in one kind of a job is different than the top performer in another kind of a job. So when you think about what you're looking for in a top performer, you know, the top person at your competitor may not be it because how they structure the work, how they organize, what their values are, that may or may not fit. So that's why we use this definition that you see here as the definition for top performer. It's somebody who's demonstrably better, significantly better than their peers at achieving the kind of business results that you require while working in an environment similar to your own. So, so different environments call for different skills. Uh, different jobs call for different skills. The key thing to hire a top performer is that you don't just settle for the average, you don't settle for mediocre, that you get somebody who's significantly better than their peer group. But the key to that is figuring out how to appeal to the people who would thrive in your culture, the kind of people who would do well in your environment, the cultural fit of the person to the job. It's more than just skills. It's that they would like working in your environment. If you're collaborative, then you're going to want to attract people who are collaborative. If you're you know, very much focused on individual achievement, then you need to set up people for that kind of an environment. And so the, the, the typical job ad almost never mentions things like um, cultural fit and almost never mentions things that relate to achievement. But if you think about it, if if you overlook the achievement factor, top performers that's, that's what drives them. You don't climb Mount Everest because it's easy. You climb it because it's hard. Top performers are innovative. They, they want to take on daunting challenges. They can't stand being bored. They get most of their self-esteem from doing what nobody else can do. They take very brief satisfaction from their achievement. You know, they, they achieve some great goal they've been working on for a year, and they might reflect and enjoy it for a day. Some people not even a whole day. And then they recalibrate and they set their sights on the next goal. If you, if you look at the history of a top achiever, top performer, they work really hard toward a goal, enjoy it very, very briefly, and instantly get started on their next goal. Sometimes they get started on their next goal before the first one's even complete. They're just addicted to the achievement. It's an uncontrollable drive. It, it, it's... You know, I don't want to call it a drug addiction, but I mean the, the, the high they get from achievement is what drives all of their work. And so what they, what they live in fear of are things that are out of their control, things that are unnecessary obstacles, bad teams, poor tools, unrealistic expectations, a company that doesn't know where it's going. Top performers are often the first people to leave a failing organization. First, because they have more options and they're more employable. But second, it makes them nutty when they can't achieve 
the next thing. When they can't, when they can no longer do their best work, they're out the door. So your ads need to demonstrate how your work environment can allow somebody to come do the best work of their lives. You need to prove that your organization can feed that hunger for achievement. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But first, I have a question for you. And the question is this. If somebody could get results working for anyone, why would they come choose to work for you? What is it? I mean, these people could work for anybody. Lots of companies want to hire a top performer. So if someone can get results anywhere, what is it that has you stand out? Posting a job description isn't enough to draw them in. Because if you think about job descriptions, if you think about how easy it is to look for a job, I mean, there's never been more tools to, to get your opportunity in front of other people. There's just a million ways to get your job in front of people. And what that means is there's never been less attention paid to any single recruiting message. So the more the venues, the more the opportunities, the more the chance for people to see opportunities, the more of a split-second decision people make when it comes time to post an ad. And when you think about your advertising performance, it, it, it brings to mind a story about two backpackers. And they were on a three-day trip. They hadn't seen anybody in weeks. Um, they're, they're miles from civilization. Um, and, and they're deep in the woods. And they come across a bear. And the bear looks angry and is going to charge. And the first backpacker drops his backpack, rips out his sneakers, takes off his hiking boots and laces up his sneakers. And the other one looks at him and says, Bob, you can't outrun a bear no matter what shoes you have on. He says, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. And when you think about your job advertising, it's very much the same way. You don't have to be the best ad of all time. You don't have to win an award for the best job advertisement, but you do have to outrun every other job ad that's in your job market for that kind of skill. That's who you're competing with. Your ad just needs to be a little better than the other options that are currently in the market. So when you think about your job advertising and you think about somebody who's currently working and is you know, doing good work in their current job, and they're not desperate. If you think about your job advertising in the, in the framework of how people see it, most job advertising is actually pretty boring. And if somebody's not eager and anxious to change jobs, what is it about your job that's going to reel them in? What is it that's going to hook them? What is it that's going to grab their attention in the first few seconds? to want to learn more about you and your organization? What is it that captures their attention? What is it that captures the attention of the right people? And that's what we're going to get into now in, in this conversation, is the questions you ask yourself when you're formulating your job ad. And there's only three of them. There's, there's three questions that are really going to make the biggest difference in how you write your employment advertising. The first question is this. A year from today, when you're sitting in the performance review of your new hire, you've hired them, you've had a great year, you know, wonderful things happened. What had to happen for you to declare that person a success? What metrics, what observable, tangible things had to happen for you to call that first year a success? You can think of this as the Christmas tree that all your ornaments are going to hang from. This is the framework. This is the structure for all of your job advertising. What does success look like? How are you going to measure it? How is the employee, currently a candidate, future employee, how are they going to measure whether they achieved it? How are you going to know they achieved it? How could a third party look and say what that success looks like? And what are the challenges toward achieving that goal? Second question is this, to, to drive the business results that you want to achieve that you know, career success after a year, what does somebody need to be good at? And this is probably just three or four things that, that really make the big difference. This isn't the laundry list of qualifications. This is the three or four things that somebody just needs to know how to do to achieve the outcome. So these examples we actually pulled from current uh, ads 
on the CFP uh, career side. And if you look at the business outcomes on the left side, uh, they're fairly straightforward, but they would be even better if they had numbers. You'll have an increased your level of direct client contact and develop confidence in client relationships. How many people? Um, what's your portfolio going to look like? When you look at the questions candidates have, there are going to be a lot of questions about scale. There's going to be a lot of questions about what you consider success, uh, how many dollars under management. It could be number of clients. It could be any number of things. But the more tangible and specific you make the accomplishment and the more um, clear you make the, the um, knowledge expectations, um, the more appealing your ad's going to be. Laundry lists of 20 qualifications, nobody really knows what's important. Right? Laundry list of business outcomes, nobody really knows what's important. But if you can really narrow it down to the top two or three business goals, maybe four or five, or in the top three, four or five things a candidate needs to know, then they can really get a sense of, is your job at the scale and level of accomplishment that's next for them? Or did they outgrow this job five years ago? Or are they not ready for this job until the next five years? The, the more specific you are in those points, the more they can kind of see themselves in the job. And then, of course, the third big question is, why would a top performer want to work for you? So again, these are examples from the career side of what um, different organizations have said about why come work for that organization. This gets to cultural fit. You know, we're all looking for people with similar skills, but what is it that has someone pick your environment? Is it, is it career growth? Is it ability to make an impact in a smaller organization? Is it a broader range of skills in a bigger organization? Is it the chance to specialize? Each different environment offers different things to people, and the key thing is that you outline those so that people can see what it is. So in a moment of looking at your ad, are they getting all of that information for them to decide whether to spend more time with you? So let's put this all together. First question, what business outcome is expected a year from today? Second question is what acid test competencies are really essential to achieving that goal? The third is the pitch. What is, what is it that the right candidate would find attractive about the candidate? or what is the right candidate would find attractive about your job? And then finally, what an interview experience are they going to have? So your first impression is that job ad, the expectations, the competencies, and what's attractive. And your second impression is the interview. And a lot of people think their first impression is the interview, but candidates have made all kinds of opinions and judgments about you long before they get to the interview. They've looked up your employer reviews on Glassdoor. They've learned all kinds of things about you. So what you thought your first impression was is at best a second or third impression. That job ad is really what's going to trigger um, people's interest in you, and a lot of people lose interest right from the job ad. So look, you know, when you think about the language you use in your job ad and how that sets the tone, for the relationship. Let's talk a little bit about the language you use. Most job ads are still using language from the 1950s. It's stiff. It's formal. It sounds like your lawyer wrote it. It's very distancing. It's, it's language like the successful candidate will have the ability to do whatever. Or, you know, or it's company focused. We are looking for da 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 da. As the reader, when you look at that, it sets a tone of kind of a distant formality. This is the language that when I entered the workforce in the 80s, you know, employers were still using language from the 1950s, right? And, and, and it's very off-putting. It's very distancing. It's very legalistic. It's very formal. But if you look, look at how most ads or most marketing is done today, if you look at how most conversations happen today. It's far less formal. It's far, far more personal. And your job ads can do this as well with just a simple kind of reframing of what you say. You can put it in the language that writes, you know, to, from the candidate's perspective. 
You will be doing this. You will be responsible for that. In this role, your responsibilities will include, uh, and, and the more you write in a personal language, then the reader finds it more relatable, they find it warmer, they find it more modern. And your goal is to get an action movie playing in the mind of your reader with them as the superhero, full of action verbs of what they will be doing. And as they read it in this language that's very personal to them, they can't help but envision themselves in the job. If you read a job ad that's written in that way, you put yourself in, in the center of the action. And you'll just by that change alone, you'll actually double your, your candidate response rates typically because it's much more appealing. So let's take a look. A typical job ad has all the standard elements. Blah, blah, blah. Our company is the largest widget manufacturer in Topeka, Kansas. Day-to-day -day responsibilities include and some list of tasks and a list of what the company wants, experience and qualifications, and often that includes a bunch of things that aren't really required, but somebody said, yeah, why not a master's degree? So you see these kinds of things included. And it's written in this distant formal language. This is a typical job ad. This is 90%, 95% of what you see on any job board on any given day, right? But you can write a much better ad. You can write an uncommon ad that creates a lot more interest if you give some context about the company, if you are candid about the reporting relationship. Who's going to report to this person? Who are they going to report to? If you have the department budget or something that they're responsible for, include some, some metrics about that. If you have realistically what the challenges the job's going to bring, put that in the ad. You can be clear. You can be candid. It sets a tone that you're not hiding. You're, in, you're putting it all out there. And the more you can give a clear definition of success and the scale of the accomplishment you're looking for, the more people can actually understand uh, what they're getting into. And, and so people want to read your ad and say, what am I doing? With whom? And why is it important? So we handle searches in all kinds of different functional areas. And you can see all of our um, ads that are written in this way on our website at any given time. You can see uh, a, a series of ads. And you might get some ideas for how you can use that kind of a language in your own ads. So it's staffingadvisors.com slash jobs. You can see 20 different examples at any given time uh, in that format. So the elements of a good job ad, the things you want to uh, be sure that you cover are going to be the context of the job in the organization. That could be a hyperlink to your website. That could be uh, awards that you've won. That could be anything that gives you kind of third-party validation and credibility. You want to include your performance expectations and action verbs to describe what you want the person to do. You want to get that movie playing in the mind of the reader. You want to show why your job is important either to your organization or if there's a broader scale of why the job is important uh, to your clients. Whatever that is, you need to clarify why it's important. You want to write it in personal language uh, to appeal to your reader. In this role, you will. Uh, you want to make the, the uh, you want to provide concrete examples and make it tangible you know, by the numbers. The more numbers you include, typically the better, because it helps people understand the context. And you want to avoid the phrases that you see in everybody else's ad, dynamic and self-starter and team player. These are, I, I call these lipstick on a pig kind of words. They're, they're used in all the ads. Everybody says them, and, and we've all learned to skip over them. So you want to avoid saying things that everybody else has said because it just makes you look like a copycat. You really, the more you're just clear about what the work is and what the role is and why it's important, the more you're clear about what it is about your culture uh, that, that's uh, different than working in other places, the more you can kind of get into that kind of uh, specificity the less you need to use the salesy marketing kinds of terms. 
Um, so that's the quick overview. Uh, that's a lot of ground that we covered in just a half an hour. And now let's uh, open it up for questions and, uh, and uh, comments. And Lisa, I think you've got some. Uh, yeah, so you can enter your questions in the uh, question and answer box. You can type it in and submit it, and um, then Bob will be able to see those and uh, answer those questions for you. Um, in the meantime, Bob, um, thank you so much for all of this great information. Um, I think it's really helpful. And I think one of the things that we've actually found on the Career Center site is that um, I kind of did an analysis of job ads that were on the site for a couple of companies who were wondering, how can I get my applications up? You know, my applications are kind of suffering here. What's going on? And I compared them to ads where they were getting a lot of applications, and the jobs that were getting a lot of applications used a lot of the principles that you described here. So I think it's really important to be sensitive to that and know that you know this is the face you're putting in front of your candidates. So you want to make sure that you're as descriptive as possible, giving them as much information as possible, so you can really attract, as you had mentioned, the top performers. One of the things, Lisa, that uh, that you point to there is we uh, regularly benchmark our ad performance uh, on any job boards that we use. We regularly benchmark our performance against the, the normal performance on the job board. Uh, and our ad reps uh, often ask us, why is it the ads are getting? They, they actually don't, they've never seen numbers like these. So we're actually often asked by uh, people why the ads do better. And the, the component parts of being personal and being specific um, really do make a significant impact. So we all pay the same money to post a job. you know. If you're going to spend the money, it's kind of your choice to get double the value or half the value uh, based on the caliber of what you uh, uh, what you put in there. Exactly. So it definitely makes a difference because, again, you know, this is uh, how you're sort of appealing or marketing yourself to a potential um, to potential candidates. While we're kind of waiting for more people to enter their questions, um, I wanted to just give you a little bit of information about the CFP Board's Career Center. Um, you know, the CFP Board is really in a unique position to connect you with the very best candidates because our outreach is, is pretty far-reaching. Um, we have over 71,000 CFP certificates that are out there. We have an additional 60,000 prospects that are in the pipeline to become a CFP. And we have relationships with um, about 230 registered programs that are educating the next generation of CFP professionals and financial services professionals. So you're going to find really all of them in the CFP Board Career Center uh, applicant pool. So. Um, on the Career Center, you can post jobs. Um, you can also make your job a featured job, which brings a little bit more attention to it graphically. Um, and there are discount packages available for multiple job listings. So if you post 5 to 10 to 15 to 20 jobs, the prices go down. Um, currently, we have about 780 searchable resumes on the site. Uh, the site launched in January, so it is fairly new, I would say. But um, we do have about about 780 at this point. Um, and then also we have resources for you as well, sort of um, content articles that will help you in terms of uh, hiring new talent, retaining talent, um, industry issues, and working with the CFP board as well. And so if you do have any questions um, about the CFP board career center, uh, you can contact me, Lisa Andrews, and my number is there, or you can email me either way. So to access the Career Center, you just go to cfp.net slash career dash center. Um, register as an employer. And then after you've posted a job, you'll have access to the resume database. So that's one question I get pretty frequently is how do I get access to the resume database? And the way you do that is to post a job. So um, and have an active job posted with us. So. Um, 
I, I think, Lisa, there may be a, a glitch in the, in the Q&A area here. Um, one of the questions we get a lot, uh, and uh, while we kind of look at the Q&A section here, one of the questions we get a lot from um, people is, you know, do good candidates answer ads? And, um, you know, do, do they have to be uh, recruited and this sort of thing? And, you know, we've done a very close analysis of the, the quality uh, difference between people who are directly recruited and people who answer ads. And the answer is there is no difference. Some people are going to answer ads at certain times in their career, and some people are not. And if you think about your own career, there are times when you're not looking at job advertising and, and times when you are. And so the, the nature in which a person engages uh, in a recruiting process um, you know, how they engage, whether it's through an ad or whether it's through direct recruiting, how they engage has no bearing on whether, you know, the caliber of person that they are. And if you say it out loud, it just makes perfect sense that sure good people enter ads and sure good people, you know, are responsive to recruiting. Um, so whenever you see anything uh, where somebody is writing about, oh, ads are you know, this or that. Um, the plain fact is we've looked at, you know, over 500 searches uh, at the quality difference between who answers ads and, and who uh, needs to be recruited, and there really is no quality difference. Uh, so um, uh, be, be wary of the agenda of anybody who uh, suggests that, <laughs> oh, advertising's dead or this, that, the other thing. Um, the plain fact is advertising is an integral part of how almost every organization hires. And, uh, and the key thing is that you write your ads that, uh, that people feel uh, like they want to put their name in, in play. So uh, still not sure if the Q&A uh, section is working properly or not, but uh, Lisa, is there anything else yeah, you want to? We are definitely um, working on that at this moment. Um, so uh, again, though, we do want to thank you, Bob, for um, for your participation in this webinar, and thank all of you who have uh, um, participated with us. Um, if you do have questions, um, you can certainly email me um, at L. Andrews at cfpboard.org, and I can definitely pass those questions on to Bob, who can then um, get back with you, if that's okay with Bob. Um, and so, again, we want to thank you for your participation today, and at this point, we will uh, go ahead and um, end the webinar. And for future webinars, please check our website. We will have future webinars coming up in the next quarter, the next two quarters, so uh, for both participants and employers. So um, again, please feel free to join us in those, and thank you again for your participation. And thank you, Bob, so much for all of your expertise. It was, it was uh, definitely needed, um, and uh, we do appreciate you participating. Thank you, everyone. My pleasure. Thank you.